Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Clark Tan. I'm Director of Industry Research and Statistics at SEMI. Uh, I, I hope everyone's safe and sound. Uh, this is my great pleasure to give the welcome remarks at the opening of today's uh, webinar on enabling next generation power devices. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude uh, on behalf of Sammy to Benick and uh, to all the listeners uh, for attending this webinar. Um, without further ado, I think I should start it, uh, uh, sharing the screen. And uh, Robert, next slide. So I would like to briefly introduce our, our company, SEMI, uh, to, to all of the listeners. Uh, SEMI is a global association serving the semiconductor design and manufacturing supply chain. Uh, SEMI connects more than 2,100 member companies and 1.3 million professionals worldwide uh, to advance the technology and business electronic design and manufacturing. We host seven regional semicons expositions and a comprehensive lineup of semi-conferences and forums around the world, which provides access to industry breakthrough, trend leaders, and partners. Uh, beyond networking uh, at our events, SEMI provides opportunity for our members to connect and collaborate through engagement within our program committees, advisory councils, think tanks, executive board and technology communities. Together with other semi-technology communities, for instance, FlexTech, FOA, MSIG, EST Alliance, uh, SEMI can bring a unique vision of future to the world and the digital economy. And this year marks the 50th anniversary of SEMI. And for that, we thank you for your support uh, for all these years, and we will continue to do our best to serve the industry. Uh, if you would like to learn more about SEMI and our member value, uh, you are welcome to reach out to me and I will be happy to connect you to our regional member managers. Next slide. So um, this is today's agenda. Uh, after my uh, brief uh, opening remarks, uh, we will start the interview, the discussion uh, with Benix expert uh, for 40 minutes, and we will leave 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Next slide. So a, a few logistic and housekeeping notice. Uh, all attendees um, will be muted, and uh, you can submit your questions during the presentation. Uh, you can find there's a question box um, in your GoToWebinar control panel, which is supposed to be on your right-hand side. You can type in your questions, and we will see those questions. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. If we have time, to, we will pick a few first. And if we do not have time to address all of them, um, the questions will be answered in written emails. Um, attendees will receive recording uh, by the end of this week. Next slide. So without further ado, um, let me introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Patrick. Um, Patrick, uh, this is my pleasure to introduce you. And could you introduce yourself to our listeners first? Of course. Thank you, Clark. And good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, I am Patrick Robinson, business executive at Semiconductor AFD at Benek. Um, maybe not a very good news, but you know I've been a kind of veteran now in this industry uh, with 35 years across semiconductor and equipment and materials companies. Um, essentially, you know, get, gain some knowledge on on processes and technology through the equipment learning as well uh, over the years. So. 
Uh, prior to BEDEC, I had uh, held several roles, including uh, lately being CTO for IoT MEMS and packaging with Flam Research, and uh, some general management in uh, some startups company, as well as earlier on um, being a technical uh, CTO for Europe at Applied Materials. Um, my PhD is from Paris University on material science, but it's a long time ago. Nice to meet you, and thanks again for Clark to uh, and Sami to hosting this seminar with us. Thank you, Patrick. That's impressive background. Uh, maybe can you talk more about your experience with the power electronics industry? Sure. So as far as power electronics is concerned, you know, my, my first experience was as a researcher at uh, Philips Labs back in the 80s, uh, essentially on microwave power ICs on compound semiconductor. So that's a while ago, but for the most part, let's say, uh, through my career with equipment companies, I've been collaborating as a technologist, uh, mostly, with many, um, many, in many, you know, projects across uh, power devices in Europe and also outside Europe. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, we will uh, have a few segments uh, for today's discussion. Uh, I think I like to start the discussion from the market demand side, uh, maybe specifically from market drivers. Uh, we, we know that this is the this is a, the, the new era of the the, the new energy. Uh, so the the renewable energy and the battery technologies um, have or will fundamentally reshape the electronic system of our, our world. Patrick, um, what, why is it now a good time to look at the growth of the power devices? Good question. So actually, you, you, one could say power electronics is everywhere and it has been for a while. So, you know, it started in industrial application in the 70s, uh, then uh, add, uh, renewable energy were added uh, around the, the cross of the century. Uh, with photovoltaics investors, for example, inverters, but then uh, more more recently, the last decade, uh, automotive and transportation uh, have, became, have become a real, uh, you know, a growth area. So, nevertheless, every 20 years, there is a new generation of power devices, and it is, that's the reason it is now a, a good time for this new revolution, actually, after 20 years. Uh, the the biotronics essentially is driven by sustainable drivers today, mega trends, as we say sometimes. Uh, so the growth of population and the mega cities, you know, they have resulted in higher energy demand and more needs for transportation uh, with uh, less pollution. So clean energy uh, is required. Uh, and this clean energy also requires improved power, def power effic device efficiency. So these are important, uh, supporting the clean energy and the power, uh, reducing, reducing the, or increasing the power device efficiency is important to sustain the growth. In, so there is a clear requirement, but also there is a new generation of power devices now, uh, which have been coming into play uh, to uh, challenge the silicon technologies, which are very well established. And these are the wide band gap devices that we will okay. certainly talk about later. Yeah, yeah. So I, my understanding is that uh, the, the power efficiency and the, the power density are, are the key metrics to to all of the power devices. Uh, so maybe can you elaborate their importance or maybe some kind of trade-off uh, you see at the device level or, or the module level? Yeah, let me let me maybe uh, go into the segment of these markets as you start to introduce this uh, concept of modules. Um, basically, this, this power market is, you know, consists of different segments. We can look at first the discrete components and the power modules. These are two parts of the market. And then if we look, zoom in into the discrete, we, we can consider the MOSFET, uh, metal oxide transistor, semiconductor transistors, and IGBT transistors, insulated gate, bipolar, very different device in operation. So overall, uh, the power electronics is growing very fast 
uh, very, let's say, if you look at semiconductor power device, we probably expect 3% um, average annual growth uh, up to more than $20 billion uh, in the next few years, maybe three to five years. Um, so that's, that's clearly uh, driving, uh, driven by uh, EV and, and also other areas, of course. So for, if we look at the same period, you know, you raise the module. So module uh, is, is a growing market. It is about, you know, one, uh, one fourth of the overall market uh, out of the 20 billion I was mentioning before. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is really driven by EV and, and the hybrid uh, vehicle. In this part, white bank gap material already uh, play a role. Uh, if we go to, to module, uh, which is the main part of the power uh, device market, uh, we can we can you know look in more details. And here uh, again, uh, there are you know different different areas of growth. The MOSFET growth is driven by uh, automotive, of course, but also industrial and computing and storage. Uh, maybe on the other end, the IGBT part of the market, which is smaller, but uh, higher voltage range of the market is, is fast growing as well. This is for charging infrastructure, for example, as well as um, potential in, uh, in, in other EV uh, applications. So okay. I, I guess that, that's covering the growth of these markets. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think you highlight the electronic charges, EV, photovoltaic, and some of the maybe consumer electronics. Uh, do you see um, so any substantial growth that see a stronger caper uh, in the next five to ten years uh, in these uh, maybe three to four areas? Yeah, I mean, as we mentioned, EV has been driving uh, this is maybe the leading area, right? Uh, basically, maybe I should come back to why this is so, so um, the trends there. So everybody, every car maker has been investing uh, now and investment are in the range of 100 billion, maybe 300 billion or more uh, in EV and, and hybrid uh, car electrification in general. So that's that's a huge trend, and this will have to address, you know, essentially the EV driving range, which has to increase above 300 kilometer probably, and also make the cars more connected, more more smart or smarter. Uh, autonom autonomous driving also is part of that, um, and and finally uh, the charging infrastructure is very important to support that EV growth. Um, and this is an area of double digit for sure uh, for, for the growth, yeah. Okay, so maybe let's move on to the uh, next slide. Uh, I think we talk about, uh, just Patrick just highlighted about uh, three major market drivers. And uh, Patrick, uh, in your view, in terms of market trend, how do you see uh, these demand transform or changes uh, the technology development? Uh, what are the new trends in the power device technologies? So, in terms of the new trend for technology, so basically the the main uh, trend in EV and and, e and, and hybrid is, is driving higher power density converters right? and reduce the size of the electronics. That's the key points. Uh, in general, this can you know this requires, uh, for, from the silicon power device point of view, in particular, uh, new packaging is required and for, for supporting higher power density. Also going through improved cooling and new substrates. What's for silicon most, maybe more than others. And then, of course, uh, the power device itself, at the level of the power device, uh, white bank and play a, a real important role now. Silicon carbide is already implemented in some car systems for onboard charger as well as main inverter. Uh, gallium nitride may be very, you know, it being integrated for low power converters as well. So uh, that's uh, in the area of electric vehicle uh, 
in the area of renewable, for example, um, you know, the same old, the wide band gap are being introduced for PV inverters, uh, silicon carbide, diodes, MOSFET in PV inverters for various, from various players already, and GAN devices of a micro inverters. So, uh, you know, if we go now to consumer, maybe the audio and white goods networking, all these uh, segments, um, the gallium nitride technology is definitely very suitable for, for consumer applications uh, because of its compactness and high efficiency uh, uh, for high frequency application. And reducing the size and the weight of these uh, little converters we are uh, moving around with <laughs> sometimes. So, uh, is there any other particular trend for the maybe consumer electronics, or uh, maybe in terms of like 5G is a is a pretty important uh, market driver right now? Is the does power device affect uh, the, the development of the 5G infrastructure or the 5G devices? Yeah, I mean, the same. The same. Let's say uh, that's something I've been looking at as part of the uh, consumer in the sense of the network supporting that. Uh, yeah, the same trend with old there, uh, and gallium nitride has definitely an important role for the speed or the frequency. Okay. So basically, the you know, in a nutshell, I would say the the wide band gap devices are more and more paving the way for for power electronics to support these sustainable drivers and trends we mentioned before. Um, okay. And this could be, you know, very simple explained, I think, uh, by the, um, if we take a step back, you know, by, by the properties of these materials and semiconductor materials, right? So if we, if we go back, uh, essentially the key figure of merit for, for these uh, power devices, which are vertical structures, is the uh, on resistance times the breakdown voltage. And this clearly, uh, is setting the scene for moving to wider band gap with uh, you know silicon then silicon carbon gallium nitride maybe sometime gallium oxide uh, being better material for 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 meeting this low on resistance high breakdown voltage requirement sure thank you um so maybe let's turn our attention to uh technologies um I think we, we discussed the uh, market drivers and trends, and we identified the, the key areas of the growth and the, the, the key uh, supporting demand from the uh, end application side. But we still there's still a lot of work we need to, to uh, overcome in terms of technologies. So uh, Rob, uh, Patrick, uh, to, to enable these design you just mentioned, those changes, um, uh, mm -hmm. Just say what are the fast growing technologies uh, maybe in, in maybe in different material silicon uh, silicon carbide gallium nitride yeah so let me maybe step back a little bit and, and make the difference between all these technologies and how they how they look like from technology standpoint so there are essentially three silic mature silicon technologies Ever for low voltage MOSFET, high voltage MOSFET, which are maybe superjunction MOSFET, and higher voltage IGBT, as we introduced them earlier. So these are three uh, technologies relying on different structures. The most advanced, the superjunction and IGBT, which have been driving innovation for the last 10 years, uh, are still going, still going to evolve. So of course, uh, uh, but. I would say both concepts are relying on a, a metal oxide semiconductor system to, for the purpose of controlling uh, a voltage control. Um, and that's very well established, one would say. Uh, on the other hand, there are two emerging compound semiconductor, so-called wide band gap semiconductor technologies. So in this area, the fast growth is is stronger. So silicon carbide, gallium nitride are faster growing technologies, definitely. Um, and I would, we can probably estimate that the, the next, over the next five years or so, there would be an average growth rate of maybe 10% or so for these technologies, even though 
of, of a total business around 20 billion, um, which maybe you know the business size is still smaller than silicon, but the business growth is way larger. Maybe um, can you elaborate on the maybe the characteristic of the silicon carbide and gallium nitride and, and, and their comparison to the silicon-based power devices and what are the good fit uh, for the application and maybe also what what are the challenges they are facing in terms of these two uh, I mean two right. materials right so. Silicon carbide is, is probably the best candidate for the high density systems, you know, um, because it's able to, to keep, uh, you know, on <laughs> operate up to high temperature, like maybe up to 200 degrees. Uh, that's uh, clearly a distinguishing, a, a very high, <laughs> a very different or differentiating feature of silicon carbide. Uh, and but for this reason, already MOSFET made of silicon carbide have been, you know, released. They are, they are coming to EV and HEV, um, as well as photovoltaic and, and some other uh, industrial markets. However, you know, there's still uh, some some way of, you know, improving, maturing the reliability and also reaching the highest voltages. Uh, with this technology. So on the on the other hand, they are probably two days less. Let's say gallium nitride is a little bit later comer uh, than silicon carbide. So they are a little bit less uh, of end products made of gallium nitride amped. So amped, I've not used the term before, but that's the structure used in gallium nitride right now with a lateral device uh, called high electron mobility transistor. Uh, and um, for example, right now, you know, voltages uh, are below, definitely below 1,000 volts in any case. Um, however, there is a good penetration already for lower voltage requirements, like in consumer, right? So the, the tens and hundreds of volt, uh, and this is a, a di differentiated factor to silicon carbide in that case. So in addition, of course, GAN is is competing with silicon carbide to some extent on the electric vehicle for some of the applications like onboard charging and, and DC converter. Yeah. So that, that's probably the most simple way to try to answer, answer your question. Uh, I would say again that silicon carbide is preferred at high voltage, above kilovolt, high current. This is more like niche market, high value, small volume, right? And the gallium nitride on silicon is preferred uh, at high frequency and middle range voltage, maybe uh, hundred volts, hundreds of volts. Uh, this is more mark, mass market uh, in that case. So um, I think we can probably uh, summarize this this way. I see. Okay. So do, do you still see the uh, the, the, the the growth potential uh, for silicon based uh, power device still being? being strong because uh, you just mentioned silicon carbide getting nitride will have uh, the higher growth rate, uh, we, which yeah. we, we all agree. Uh, but I think the silicon-based power device will still uh, have a, 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 some some segment that will fit better in terms of the cost and performance. Yes, yes, sure, sure, for sure. I mean, maybe I was not very clear, but right now the old market is essentially silicon-based. You know, close to twenty billion dollar market is essentially silicon based, for except a few percent. Uh, and as the growth of the overall market is three, or three more than three percent over the next years, this is a very significant increase for silicon, right? <laughs> and of course, in a in a relative number, I mean, when you go to percentage, the growth of silicon carbide and gallium nitride is more uh, important in double digit for silicon carbide. Uh, but still the large numbers are for silicon and, and there are continuous improvement in technology when we talk about maybe technology challenges there is still a lot of work uh, to to improve further improve the superjunction or the IGBT for example yeah great thank you so uh, maybe let's move on to the technical challenges we are facing uh, 
So I, I don't understand the, the manufacturing ability of power devices is, is very challenging for not only um, the, the, the silicon carbide and nitride and, and, and a lot of novel materials. Patrick, uh, what, uh, what are some of the technical challenges are, are most common in, 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 in the in device maker side? Okay, that's a very complex question as we speak about so many different devices, but let's say to, to put it uh, in the most simple way, uh, I, I, I would like to start with silicon MOSFETs, for example, uh, and what are their challenges. So there are basically two main grand, or grand challenges. One is to get a low on resistance, which is essentially, or for, for a large part, associated with very thin wafers. So a very large challenge of the power, uh, silicon power device industry is to deal with very thin wafers, maybe less than a 50 micron uh, type of thickness. Another grand challenge is to make the uh, high breakdown voltage. And when it comes to trench MOSFET and to some extent IGBT, which have, you know, at the end, similar parameters, structural parameters. Uh, the, deep, the deeper the trench, the better in terms of breakdown. Uh, so this, this is a very important aspect. Uh, I would say the trench structure or the trench module is, is critical to silicon technologies. Um, that's, that's, that's really key. Um, so basically, you know, um, there will be for silicon technologies um, a lot of requirements associated with that. So the, the quality of the edge, for example, and the quality of the thin films, uh, which are deposited after these uh, high aspect ratio structures are made. Right? Uh, regarding silicon carbide, we can consider the technology, uh, let's say one key factor is the size of the wafers. That's one of the most challenging part. The size of wafer may be in production reaching 150 millimeter today. Um, and there is some path to 200, but this is probably behind uh, silicon for sure, uh, and uh, and even gallium nitride on silicon as of today, which is available on 8 inch. So um, I think that's a key element. If we go to device structure again, uh, the silicon MOSFET um, and trench MOSFET are similar, let's say, in structures as silicon silicon carbide, so we are similar in structure to silicon MOSFET. So in that case, similar requirements will exist in terms of edge or uh, deposition, uh, for example. Um, however, silicon carbide is harder to edge, probably. Yeah. So maybe this challenge is even more uh, critical for silicon carbide. Uh, the deposition challenge re remains the same. Another critical area of technology for silicon carbide is the high temperature. So any doping, whether implant or diffusion, will require uh, high temperature. So that's something quite different to silicon. So uh, la late, uh, last but not least, gallium nitride technology. It's a very, you know, very promising uh, technology based on heterostructure between algan and GAN, aluminum gallium nitride and gallium nitride. Uh, essentially, um, you know, the main device is aiming at an enhancement mode uh, to be more suited to power uh, to power application, and that requires some specific approach, uh, specifically the recess, uh, recessing the aluminum gallium nitride. So at the end, uh, and there are different ways to do that. You know, maybe PGAN or hybrid or misamped, which is becoming more popular. So basically, this also requires a recess, a kind of trench edge, if we wish, uh, and, and also a very, um, let's say, a sensitive uh, gate dielectric deposition, for example. So um, I should add, by the way, that gallium nitride is, uh, is also uh, very much driven by the quality of gallium nitride epitaxy on silicon, of course. Mm -hmm. And it is a significant part of the cost, maybe close to half of the cost of a wafer. So that's definitely another area of focus for for the industry, right? Um, ne nevertheless, let's say I would, if I 
uh, focus on the structure of the devices, uh, no surprise, uh, critical edge and critical depositions exist. Yeah. I see. Okay. So uh, maybe aside from material itself, uh, what what technique or technologies do do you do you think that semiconductor manufacturing need, need to uh, overcome to to solve these challenges? So if I, you know, kind of logical way, if I, if I continue on this discussion, there, there is a need for advanced edge and deposition technologies, both, right? That's one key. Uh, for the edge, um, either it's advanced deep silicon edge, you know, it's a long, I mean, kind of uh, um, mature technology in some sense. It started with DRAMs, DRAM technology maybe in the 90s, so it's a long time ago, and now it has been, you know, very much in use in, in in power for a long time, but still very critical. And this extension of this technology to silicon carbide is probably a key as well. Or for the case of GAN, another critical edge is called, is called atomic layer etching, so kind of layer by layer recess uh, to stop very precisely uh, at the interface or, or close to. Uh, for GAN and uh, between GAN and ALGAN. So that's the edge part. The deposition part, um, traditionally the, the MOS structure for silicon and silicon carbide is made by thermal oxidation today. So one could think this is very solid, <laughs> you know, it has been the cornerstone of silicon industry for a long time. Um, until in CMOS, for example, IK materials needed to be introduced. Uh, because the thermal oxides were too thin to be made. So in similar way, eventually, the, the MOSFET in silicon carbide and silicon may be moved out of thermal oxidation. We, we have some work ongoing in these areas as well, actually, uh, even if it could be surprising. So uh, moving on gallium nitride, definitely in that case, uh, beyond the passivation of the material, the, the critical gate Deposition, gate electric deposition is, is important uh, mm -hmm. since there is no, let's say, high quality native oxide uh, for gallium nitride. There is no other way than making a, a controlled deposition there. Okay. So I think maybe we can uh, dig a little bit deeper in terms of uh, deposition um, technologies. Uh, maybe can you uh, quickly compare? Uh, different deposition uh, methods uh, for the power devices. Sure. So let's say, of course, we have different levels of deposition. So intermetal dielectrics and other things, for example, or metal depositions, uh, which are not really different for for these devices, the, the new devices compared to the others. But one, the, if I stick to the critical area of, you know, the the gate dielectric or the surface passivation dielectrics. Uh, I think there are not too many technologies there, to be honest. Uh, if, if, uh, if a replacement to thermal oxide is needed or if there is no thermal oxide, uh, basically CVD doesn't really work for that. You know, we are talking about small, very thin layers, very conformal layers, doesn't really work with CVD or plasma CVD. Uh, so, bottom line, we have to turn to atomic layer deposition, and that's in this in this area really uh, n there is no rival rival to 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 ALD for the conformality and the thickness control and the you know the precision of, of uh, engineering your fins basically. So ALD also allows low temperature below 400 degree um, and a large range of uh, oxides and nitrides, especially IK dielectrics, um, as it has been already a standard now in, in the CMOS arena. So high quality with um, high precision, that's that's the key word for me, these applications. And one may ask, you know, how about the, the throughput and the production worthiness of AD? Maybe, yeah. maybe the... <laughs> Maybe this is a question coming to us sometimes, you know, uh, isn't it too slow? <laughs> uh, 
so we have all been, you know, experiencing that in our career sometime. But really, ALD has made uh, some, you know, some leapfrog uh, by being able to integrate uh, mini batch ALD like 25 wafer and make it compatible with single wafer for more uh, specific steps, let's say, like plasma LD going together. So altogether, we can reach LD can reach throughputs in the tens of kind of tens of wafer per hour, which are production worthy for most of these cases, right? Yeah, that that that's actually good to know because yeah, I mean, LD is I think is is gaining a lot of market traction, but not not only in power devices, but even uh, in the uh, the memory in the spaces, I think the because of the precision and the and the, the uniformity characteristic, I think it's it's this is getting a lot of attractions. Um, so I think the, the there was some maybe the I would say this conception about the lo lower throughput, maybe one one layer at a time. I think they, they I think the uh, some of the device maker has the has make some breakthrough in some designs. Um, so maybe let's, uh, I, before we uh, continue, I would like to encourage the, the, the attendees and the listeners to submit your questions uh, in your question box. Uh, so um, mm -hmm. so our, uh, ex, our guest speakers, experts, Patrick, he can answer. Um, so uh, the next part, I would like uh, maybe invite uh, Patrick to briefly introduce Panic. Uh, and its solution for the power uh, device manufacturers. Okay, thank you. So, Benek, you know, Benek is a company founded in 2005, you know, 15th anniversary this year. Um, it is headquartered, headquartered, headquartered in the Finland, Espo, Finland, um, the, with an ALD fab uh, there, basically, uh, maybe 170 employees as of today, growing fast. Um, and more than 30 years experience in ALD, definitely uh, in that company. So more recently in, in ALD, in semi-ALD, which is basically the equipment for semiconductor, uh, we have introduced uh, about a year ago uh, a new cluster tool, which we call Benek Transform. Uh, this, this is a fully automated ALD solution. Uh, it enables, you know, very best best versatility and higher volume and i would say and or higher volume because depending on the different steps of your development prototyping larger mass production for example so the system is based on industry standard uh, transfer modules and and the configuration is very flexible and scalable uh, you know it's really adapted from r d to uh, mass production or high volume manufacturing uh, and large range of wafers. Um, it's, it's also including the different types of, you know, technology I mentioned, thermal ALD in mini batch as well as uh, plasma ALD. Uh, and we have a very differentiated solution to accelerate throughput by using a preheating step, uh, a fast preheating step, which basically makes a better use of the uh, very critical ALD modules we have on our tools. Um, and this to 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 finish this description of this new platform uh, which is condensing all Benek LD technology uh, basically uh, we this is compatible of course with semi uh, you know standards for for safety and ergonomics for example and other uh, fab requirements as well so i would say with this platform of course we address uh, the the power devices as we discussed but i would extend that to all more than more markets right maybe power overall from device standpoint is the largest one in the more than more markets but we also expand that very much in the rf whether it's rf filters or rfics for compound semi for example but also the mems definitely and other sensors like image sensors uh, and compound uh, semi photonics uh, going into led and micro led uh, one very important application, by the way, for power MOSFET, for, for power devices, sorry, is um, is encapsulation or barrier. Uh, in specifically, this uh, this appears at 
you know, at all levels, like wafer level, but also up to the modules, uh, which we are talking about. The, the need for new materials in module uh, encapsulation also uh, extend to ALD. So I, I hope this is a short description uh, suitable for you, for Benek. Okay, uh, thank you. So I think that then we will go into the Q&A sessions. Uh, I do receive a few questions from the audience. Um, maybe let me start with the, the question from Peter. Um, uh, which are the major material and process technology required to accommodate the trend in terms of processing, like deposition, automation, etching, and lithography? Uh, major materials, sorry, I missed major that. Major material and process technology required to accommodate the trend right. in the process. So, so if we go back a step on, on the edge side, as we mentioned edge, uh, there are clear you know, requirements for um, things like um, atomic, I mean, atomic layer etching, which is the most differentiated one recently. And that, that part uh, requires, uh, I would say, specific approach to etch, which resemble atomic layer deposition, essentially, uh, in, in principle. Um, and the, the the gas is there, or, or the, the technology there is is not so different, except that you need to adapt to have the, the, the switching capability of atomic layer processes, basically. Um, now, moving on the position, the key materials are, I would say, IK materials. Aluminum oxide is one popular, but it's not only that; it's also uh, SiO2 by ALD. They are competing on silicon. Right, right now, it's start to, to be considered for replacing thermal oxide. Uh, so it's not a new material, but a new way to deposit or make this material on the substrate. Uh, so SiO2, aluminum oxide, and other IK materials in general. Um, we have some nitrides, which are very important in some of these, uh, important in these uh, critical stacks, such, such as aluminum nitride is an important material, or maybe some other uh, type of nitride, yeah. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, so the next question comes from Simon. Um, for the power device manufacturing, how critical is pre-LD clean step for putting down films uh, in terms of uniformity, rate, etc., versus uh, what is seen in advanced logic devices? Uh, uh, this is just the first part of his question. Right. So I may not be up to speed on the very advanced logic <laughs> devices, to be honest. But if I'm if I'm correct, uh, there is still like an important step is still having an interfacial uh, SiO2 uh, to be used before dealing with other maybe other IK material or uh, on top of that of it. Uh, I think same probably holds in as long as you have silicon as a starting material. Eventually, same if you have silicon carbide. Uh, it is a very different case for gallium nitride and maybe potentially silicon carbide, where where you 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 need to remove you know non-stoichiometric oxides uh, another way, and you cannot grow them. So bottom line. Uh, you you really need a kind of pre-cleaning uh, mm -hmm. in many cases, and and we we have also that capability on our tools to to be able to prepare the surface, let's say, before okay. start in, when it's needed. Yeah, yeah. So that that that's actually uh, the Simon's uh, mm. the, the second part of his question is, uh, do you also work on the integrating pre-LD cleaning in your yeah. equipment? We do, yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, so the, the next question: uh, Can you explain how ALD is used for encapsulation in power module? Uh, is there any examples? So basically, you 
maybe you can, you know, LD has been used in OLED for encapsulation for quite some time. It has been maybe the starting market about maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and in that case, you know, the requirements are very stringent. You need very low temperature not to destroy the material. Uh, so as low as maybe below 100, definitely, maybe 80. So this technology exists. And there are, there are some more or less sophisticated stacks you can make to get the you know the required barriers we you need uh, so the, the barriers you need sorry uh, similar materials which we call nanolaminate sometimes uh, mm -hmm. are made with two different LD films in this low temperature range and they are uh, very good candidates to 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 be used inside the modules. I see. So, um, so the next question comes from Stefan. Um, so, which LLD material is most common in GAN hand? I think the process, the material of record, if you wish, has been aluminum oxide. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, maybe if earlier in implementation was was as simple as that. Uh, but I would say that the gate the stack, uh, the gate dielectric stack, is more complex if you want to pump up your performance than just adding a, a simple aluminum oxide. So you need to deal with interface, essentially, as we already discussed. And moving forward, there are there are also new you know materials coming into play. I O K maybe. Okay. Like so uh, there's, yeah, there's one question about packaging technology in terms of power devices. I, uh, mm. um, there's a, what's the technology trend in terms of power device module? And what's the, is there any major challenges that remains to be solved? Hmm. I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best to answer this question in general, right? Uh, we know as LD, let's say provi solution provider, we know more about the encapsulation part, but mm -hmm. they, they definitely have other things like I mentioned in general terms, the substrates, change new ceramics maybe can be, should be used for substrate uh, and the cooling is also important. So, yeah. I see. so uh, next question is, is ALD is already used in commercial IGPT? Uh, second car by MOSFET and uh, or some some other IGPD MOSFET? Hmm. Good question. Uh, <laughs> not sure I can answer that question. But let's say depends what we say what we consider by use. So if it's under development I would say yes. Whether it's it's production I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so I do have one other question. Uh, so when when the device maker they when evaluating or selecting the the maybe for instance ALD equipment, what what, what factors do, do they need to consider? Yeah, very very important question. G given the uh, you know the reputation of ALD you mentioned earlier. Um, I believe the probably the most important is to be able to develop their technology with ALD. You know, there is one rule in FAPS: if you don't have a capability, you will never introduce it, right? So when you start to make your technology development, you need to have the capability or access the capability. So mm -hmm. that's something we supplement actually or complement by adding services. But you know, bottom line, uh, to real make a real complete technology you need a versatile tool so a kind of platform where you can start with prototyping kind of technology development work using the real materials and having the same materials available and the same technology to ramp it up on a let's say more complete and higher production work higher throughput platform 
So extendability of the platform is very important, I believe. Okay. So the next question uh, is from Mike. Um, how should cooling be improved? Is silver sintering a good option? Uh, I think there are some flavors of silver, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, sorry. So, I, again, not, not so deep in packaging. Sorry about that. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so maybe the last question before we uh, we, we close uh, today's webinar. Uh, so we will leave the, the emails in the last slide. Uh, operator, could you move the slide to the last slide so people can see the email address and that he can. Um, so you yeah. can either contact me or, or Patrick. Um, so the last question is, um, which purity level of uh, ALD precursor needs to be used? I think this is a pretty important question. So we are we are using standard semi-grade uh, for, for these precursors, which are, I would say, same quality as gases for the that are used in processing. I'm not 100% sure about the number of nine, but maybe uh, five nine. Yeah. Okay. We'll check. Semi-grade. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I think with that uh, we would like to uh, conclude our webinar today. I thank uh, Patrick to be our guest expert, guest speaker today, and I hope all of you enjoyed uh, the conversation on the on the power device. Uh, uh, the, the market and the, the horizon, and also we talk about the deposition technology and the challenges we are facing. Um, uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions, and this uh, webinar recording will be available uh, by the end of this week uh, to, a, to every participant. And thank you for attending, and thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Clark, for supporting that all the way, and have a good day, everyone. Yep, have a good day. Stay safe and sound. Bye for now. Bye-bye.